Welcome to the first episode of Living Life Differently, and I'm delighted to have with us today my sister Ellie Mahoney. Good morning. Hi. Morning. How's it going? How are you? Yeah, good. Good. Not too bad. How are you? Yeah, we're good. Thanks. So today is all about finding out a bit about your life and how you're living it differently um because you've got quite an interesting backstory in terms of how you ended up in France a few years ago um so do you want to give us a little bit of a snapshot about you know what happened about 10 years ago you went there you know how did that come about what was going on for you at the time in the UK yeah so it was it was pushing 12 years ago now actually it was around uh 2008 2009 and obviously there was the huge financial crash. Um, and so I, at the time, at the, just before that all happened, I was living in a lovely house, had a lovely car, had a great job, nice salary. And then um, two businesses that I ended up working for um, basically lost really big customers. Um, and so I lost my job the first time round um, because of that. So I was then scrabbling around trying to find another job, found one quite quickly worked in that place for about a year and then they lost a huge chunk of their business as well as far as I can remember it was a long time ago now um, and so I was in this position where all of a sudden I'd gone from having this amazing lifestyle so I thought anyway I thought what was important was having a nice house you know having a nice car going away for the weekends having a, a nice mountain bike um, traveling to you know different cities around Europe with my friends I had this great lifestyle so I thought because it was kind of what I guess this sort of like you're brought up to kind of expect, you know, 2.4 kids and the dog and all that. Um, I didn't have that. I had cat, a cat <laughs> and I chose not <laughs> to have children, which is another factor. Um, so I was left in this position where I couldn't afford my three story house. I couldn't afford my car. And I was sort of rapidly sort of running out of, of being able to afford to pay the mortgage. And if you remember, I came to live with you for a little while in Wales. Um, yeah. And so I yeah what was I doing I, I basically sort of had to um scrabble around trying to find a, a rental agent which I'd never done before I'd lived in this beautiful house which I spent loads of money doing up and decorating and I was really really proud of that house but again it's very materialistic kind of thoughts beautiful car I loved my Audi oh my god I missed that car <laughs> uh, again it, it was all sort of like you know I'd gone from this very much of a mind of like possessions and things and all these sparkly bits and bobs and adventures um to literally almost having nothing uh, i couldn't pay the mortgage i had to basically give the car back i owed the car financiers uh, quite a lot of money i owed northern rock a shitload of money um and so i i got some tenants in and i decided um okay well i like that sort of lifestyle of travel and adventure I like going away to different places and seeing seeing new things. How can I kind of do that affordably and still have a bit of an adventure? So I just sort of, I don't know where the idea came from, but I just started looking at living overseas. And because I really love mountain biking, I um, started investigating really good mountain bike areas in Europe. Cause I thought, well, Europe's close enough. I had considered Canada, but then looking at the logistics of having family and friends coming over to visit. It was like eight to 10 hour flights or whatever it was. And it, it, that just seemed a little bit too far, but it wasn't sort of off the radar longer term. Um, and so I temporarily moved in with you. I think during that time, I found a job at a rubbishy little hotel in a, in a village in, in a, a ski resort in the French Alps. Um, and so I decided that if I couldn't have that kind of lifestyle where I could afford to go away and pay for holidays and stuff, then why don't I just go and live somewhere that would be a holiday destination, that is a holiday destination for lots of other people, and just see if I could kind of carve out a bit of a life for myself. Um, so I chose mm -hmm. this little village called Leger, um, which was where one of the mountain bike World Cups had been back in, I don't know, 2003 or four or something. And actually, weirdly enough, the hotel that I stay at, that I was working at, for the six months that I was there, um, was actually where the mountain bike World Cup teams had stayed, or the, U the UK teams had stayed anyway. Um, so that was all kind of like, okay, well, it's mountain biking, I'll meet people, I'll give it a shot, what's the worst that could happen? So I'd literally, I downsized from my 
big three story house into uh, a builder's van, which I got for 400 quid. So I'd swapped like a 15 grand Audi for a builder's van for 400 quid, loaded it to the gunnels, left loads of other stuff in the house for the people to rent. Um, and I up sticks and I, via your house in Wales, <laughs> I ended up in the Alps. So, uh, I mean, that journey to making that decision to buy the builder's van, it was a beautiful builder's van, wasn't it? What colour was it? bright orange <laughs> we literally just had the lights taken off it and i think there was still holes in the roof where the you know the big flashing lights were on the back which was leaking for quite some time after i had it um but yeah i mean it was sort of before you know the whole big evolution of van life um kind of happened and I, and I hadn't really planned on living in the van but i was kind of like i know i need to be mobile and i know i need to like take a load of my possessions with me and my cat tree call bless him um who <laughs> who was on the big bench seat in a, in a rabbit cage on the front with me so he could kind of stretch out and move around um yeah so i just i just thought it was that whole thing of like i like i like being away i like going to different places and exploring so how can i achieve that um and i basically decided that going to live in a different country wouldn't be such a bad idea right what's the worst that could happen and i given myself sure. in my head I think I'd set myself six months. I'll give it a try for six months and I'll see what happens. If it doesn't work out, I'll come back, tail between my legs um, and uh, I'll figure something out in the UK. Because again, you know, I might not go back into that same salary band or I might not have such a nice car or house yeah. or whatever, but I'm still here. I'm still alive. It's not really the end of the world. It felt like it at the time. I tell you that when I lost yeah. the house. Well, I, I eventually lost the house. I can come back to that. But when I had to move out of that house, there was this whole kind of like, I felt socially kind of crushed. It was like I was a failure. Um, but I knew I wasn't because it was just kind of like, um, I suppose it's what people expect you to achieve. There's a lot of that sort of mm. culture in the UK, I think, isn't there? That you're keeping up with the Joneses and you're sort of comparing your house to the neighbour's house or oh, they've got a nice car, maybe we should upgrade ours or that whole very materialistic sort of way of looking at things. And I mean, I did come crashing down with a big bump um you know because of because of losing my job and everything and not having that kind of money um but i quickly realized looking around at you know the stuff in the house that i had i was like these are just possessions you know these are just things i may have loved buying them i may have loved how they looked in the house but ultimately like they are not me they're not a part of me they're just things they can be replaced you know yeah. i can build this if i want to i can rebuild that somewhere else like it's not the end of the world so I sold off a whole bunch of stuff. I left a load of stuff in the house to, to rent out. I gave away some stuff to my friends and uh, and then packed up whatever else I thought I needed to go to France with in the van. So, yeah. So from the time that things kind of got to get difficult financially with the job losses and you starting to think that maybe you wanted a different life, what, and you know, what, what kind of time scale was it between you started to have, you know, the, that kind of change in life that wasn't in your control to the point that you kind of took control and decided, right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my life. Was that over a period of months or years? What kind of time scale? I think between six months and a year, because for, for a considerable chunk of time at first, I was trying to figure out um, how can I make ends meet and how can I not let this crash and burn? Um, and that I was going through quite a lot of stress about how am I going to afford to pay the mortgage back? And I was sort of running around chasing my tail, trying to find jobs, not getting anywhere. So there was that whole kind of like, I need to maintain this kind of period of time, which I think I guess was a, a chunk of months. Um, and so I suppose between, if you think, I don't know, between 2008 and 2009, that was that whole kind of transition period. So I, I guess about a year really. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I just, I just didn't want to, sort of I don't know I don't know what really drove me to do it it was just like I thought well it's it, why not it's a good time for change you know the situation in the UK was pretty dire jobs were hard to come by you know everybody was kind of like in a bit of um, a bad situation I knew I couldn't afford to, to jump straight in and buy another house um, yeah I just it was just that kind of un, unsurety I suppose of like I didn't know what the future was going to hold so why don't I just try and carve out my own future and carve out my own path a little bit um, yeah and I didn't really have anything anybody to lean on to go off of against I mean I guess had you been to Malta at that point I can't remember had you lived in Malta by then? um no I'd been 
backpacking. So I'd been around the world with my backpack and after I'd came, I'd come back to live with you for a short time. So that would have been 2006 um, uh-huh. before, you know, going off and doing other things. So, so I've been away and done that. What, what age were you when this happened? And what remember your friends and family thinking about what you were planning to do? So, what, I'm 45 now, so I was 32, 32, 33. Yeah. I think, well, I know, every, I think everybody, friends and family <laughs> included, I think you all thought, like, oh, she'll be back. She'll be back. Um, and I do remember, <laughs> I remember getting messages from people saying, like, oh, you know, so when are you coming back then? And I was like, I'm not sure that I am, you know. And, you know, six months turned into... Uh, seven or eight months turned into a year turned into two years and before I knew it I mean I'd stayed I stayed in Leger for um, two or three two years give or take a couple of summer seasons because summer was all about mountain biking right and just getting out on the hill as much as possible there's an, an amazing bike park there and you can ride all the way to Switzerland and back um, the Port de Soleil which probably many people know um, and so I was having so much fun I'd gone from um, riding, you know, my my little carbon frame mountain bike around like Woolerton Park or, you know, parts of the Peak District and, you know, just doing lots of cross country riding. And when I got to the Alps, it was like, wow, this is like a whole nother kind of thing. And so I'd upgraded my bike to a sort of a more enduro, um, hard wearing kind of bike that could handle the downhill and stuff as well. And I was having a great time. I met so many people, so many like minded people as well, which I think was the the, the key thing for having me stay. Um, I was having a ball. I was earning a pittance, an absolute pittance. I was earning, I think my first year there, I was earning 600 euros a month and I had accommodation thrown in. Um, and so I was living in shared accommodation again. It was like going back to being a student. It was rough. It was really, <laughs> it was probably worse than student accommodation, but I didn't care. It was like, I had this shitty old van. Me and my cat were there. I, I made loads of friends um, and it was just a complete turnaround. And then after a couple of years of being in Leger, I kind of started to, I was saying about, you know, I could rebuild and I could start to kind of rebuild my life a little bit more. So I started to think, well, okay, it would be nice to have a little bit more money. You know, scrabbling around on 600 bucks a month is is, is nothing. Um, and especially with mountain bike repairs and other bits and bobs uh, and van maintenance as well, which God, that absolutely sucked me dry of money as well. Um, and so after a couple of years there, I decided that I could do with a better job. And there were more prospects um, in a bigger town a few hours away called Chamonix um, at the foothills of Mont Blanc. And so I started to look around for jobs over there and uh, I found a job and basically went and moved there and lived there for eight years. Before we get into Chamonix and so, yeah, eight years later, you <laughs> into another new life almost aren't you yeah but before <laughs> we get to Chamonix let's let's go let's go back to that van because it sticks in my memory not just for the fact that it was bright orange how much did you pay for it 400 pounds UK right you got a four it's rammed to the rafters in fact you could I remember opening you opened the side door when you arrived at my house the one day and yeah you it's like a wall see anything. it was like a like... cartoon packed full of stuff and, and little tree cat you know sat there in his little cage and and you you've literally just put everything in this van your life is in this 400 pound van and you're ready to go what what was that feeling like you've you've made the decision to go you, you found a little job to go to to somewhere that you'd never been before people you'd never met before what, how were you feeling at that point were you excited were you nervous what was going on in your head? A, a bit of everything. I mean, looking back, I think I was quite naive and, and, and a bit maybe stupid and reckless. I don't know. But I was just like, well, it's an adventure. Um, I don't remember feeling like overtly like, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. I just kind of went, I just had this really pragmatic kind of sense of I just need to I just need to do this. Let's get it done. You know, let's get there. Let's let's carve out a new life and, and see what happens. Um, there was a sense of like anticipation and not knowing what was going to happen so that was a little bit of maybe apprehension Um, but yeah it was just like okay I'm I'm setting off I'm going to do this and I just got that kind of dogged mindset of like I'm going to make this work you know this is going to work I'm going to do it 
Um, <laughs> yeah, so I didn't have a clue about bloody <laughs> van maintenance and stuff. And if you remember, not long <laughs> set off from your house not even that far down the m4 or what was it the m4 i can't remember um and i'd overfilled yeah. oil on the van and so the whole cab i hadn't even set off for a couple of hours i think and the whole cab in the van started filling up with smoke and i was like oh, holy shit the van's gonna blow up and i'm on the side of the motorway going like what the am i doing here me and the cat sat on the bank by the side of the road and i'm like oh shit, I might have blown things up and I might not be able to get to France. And then the maintenance or the recovery van came and sorted me out. Um, yeah, it was just <laughs> things like that. It was like, I was just so sort of blind to certain things and prepping and whatnot. And also I remember I couldn't drive very fast. The top speed I think was about 30 or 40 miles an hour because I had so much stuff in the back. It was really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> it took me, you it took even me, took a Christmas trip, didn't position. you? Huh? You even tree. took a Christmas tree with you. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Did you get to Leger on day one? I can't remember. Did you no, arrive there days. that first yeah, day? Yeah, we, we had to do an overnight. I don't remember where it was. Somewhere on the outskirts of Paris. Well, you know, you know that journey much better than I do these days. But um, um, yeah, somewhere like not Amiens. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, we ended up in this campsite, which I had, you know, I knew that I had to kind of break it up because of the, the speed that we were going and stuff. So I was like, um, <laughs> camp pulled up to this campsite. I was like, oh, we'll just go over here in this little corner. It's nice by the trees. And uh, so I had the tent, you know, we were, we, were, we me and the cat, uh, <laughs> were sleeping in the tent <laughs> at night. Um, and I tell you what, <laughs> the biggest mistake I made was going to sleep next to this big row of trees because as soon as dawn came around, all the birds were like oh, 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 waking up and Trika was like, Wah! oh my God. Um, so yeah, I didn't really get that much sleep. Um, and then he was kind of stomping around and stuff as well. So that that was quite uh, quite an interesting experience. And then we just cracked on and then um, drove on that blooming windy road up to Leger, which was, oh, I swear to God, all the, all the locals must have been absolutely cursing me because I was going so slow and there's n not many places to kind of overtake there as well. So yeah, it took a long time. And then when I turned up in, I actually had to go to Morzine first to meet the guys who were running the hotel. And I think I spent the night with them. And then the next day I actually got into Leger Centre. So I had to go through Leger to Morzine and then come back again. Um, and, and they did the same thing that you did, the double take when I opened the sliding drawer of the van. And they, <laughs> stuff. they were like, what the? <laughs> the so you get, <laughs> you get to Leger, you're earning 600 euros a month as a living, you know, employee. Um, yeah. How did that compare financially to what you were earning, you know, in, in the peak job before financial difficulties and, and being made redundant and things so I was earning uh I think about 42 43 grand a year <laughs> so I don't know what that is per month but uh, not 600 euros yeah. that's for sure um but like I said yeah, yeah. the information was thrown and in so that was that was kind of mostly just living living uh, money basically sure and then in terms of what you actually went to France with financially what what did you have in your back pocket you know did had you managed to save any money? You mentioned selling things. Yeah, I don't remember having that much in my back pocket, but I do remember winning on the national lottery. Do you remember that? No. <laughs> so this is what paid for the ferry and the fuel. OK, so I don't know if you remember. It was at your house and I got it was before the Euro Millions, I think. So I played the lottery and I got five numbers out of six on the national lottery. And I was like, oh, my God, I've like I've paid off the mortgage for the house. Oh, this is just an absolute <laughs> godsend. My life is sorted. I can go away without any problems. I don't have to worry about anything. And I got you to call the winning number because you have to ring up if you get a certain um, number of, of stars or whatever on the on the school on the scorecard on the lottery ticket. And I was trembling and I was like, I can't ring them. You've got to ring them. So I made you call them to find out how much I'd won. And I was like, oh, it's going to be like 40, 50 grand. It's going to be amazing. And I think I actually won. I mean, it's nothing to sniff at. It was like 1,235 quid. So that was what I had in my back pocket. 
and I don't remember much being left in my bank account. I, I literally, I, I never had any savings ever in my life. Everything mm. was very much like live for the moment, spend the cash that you've earned that immediately, you know. So, or, or put it into the house, you know, to repair walls or fix up the kitchen or whatever it might have needed, <clears throat> or maintaining the car or whatever. And so I'd never had savings throughout my whole life. I was very much in debt. I lived on credit cards. I lived on finance. Um, when I got the mortgage for the house, I got it at 110% mortgage, which thanks to Northern Rock, um, wow, that yeah. kind of hamstrung me as well. Um, so I was always indebted in, in a big way um, with you know finance and credit cards. And I think I'd wrapped up a whole bunch of finance into the mortgage as well. So my mortgage was much more than the actual mortgage. It was a whole load of consolidated debts too. So going back to the question of how much did I have, it was that lottery ticket winning um, and not very much else, to be honest. Yeah. I actually forgot about that, but now you now you mentioned the story. You yeah. know, it's come in and remembering how, how oh my God, oh my God, how much yeah. is it going to be? And then a bit like, yeah. oh, but hey, that's still a decent quick, you know. money. Exactly. So apart from, apart from finances, apart from a van packed to the rafters with a little cat treacle um what language skills did you take with you Absolutely. what was your french like were you already <laughs> it was a uh, on y va à la rochelle like the old you know french school lesson level french it was very much nothing <laughs> Je m'appelle Ellie. Yeah, that's it. It was it was nothing. I hadn't practiced anything before I went. I'd, I didn't know anything apart from what I'd learned at school. Bearing in mind I was 32 and I obviously left school at whatever, 16. I had just this vague recollection of a few words of French. That was it. I hadn't planned. I hadn't rehearsed anything. I hadn't practiced anything or done any lessons or anything. I just I just went, I'll figure it out when I get there. So, yeah. yeah. So, Leger life sounds quite fun in that obviously it sounds like social life was absolutely fantastic financially it wasn't brilliant but you're living in a completely different lifestyle than you were before so yeah. it sounds like they kind of offset each other quite a bit so yeah. how long did you say you stayed in Leger? I think about two years either just under or just over two years yeah yeah and I started okay. off I think I did the first so six then months an... for the first six months of that little hotel and then I moved over to working for um, a chalet company, and that was like a nice five-star chalet up on the hill, up in La Torche, um, called Ferme de Montagne, with Suzanne and Henry. And um, yeah, so I was kind of, I went from like um, um, a do anything at the hotel, sort of like making beds, cleaning sick out of sinks, wiping floors, serving in the bar, serving in the restaurant, literally anything, mopping floors, stocking linen, all of that, I went from that, which you can appreciate when I mentioned the sick, um, you can appreciate why I might have wanted to move into something else. So I went into a, <laughs> basically a posh chalet, which again had accommodation thrown in. And so for the first um, chunk of time I was living there, I basically had a little chalet to myself, which was this tiny, really, really old, like 60s chalet, it was very drafty. Um, and I was living there, there was two two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and I literally had that place to myself. And downstairs was the wine cellar, underneath the house was the wine cellar for the chalet. And so I just literally had this like walk of like one house to the next as a commute to go to work, which was great. Um, and so I worked there for a while, again, serving in the restaurant, helping clients, you know, book ski lessons, um, fixing staff uniforms literally anything and everything they needed. I helped in the office doing operation stuff. So again, I'd kind of like gone, gone up a level then, going back to more of a, a job where I could utilize some of the skills that I had from previous work. And so got into sort of more operations and um, and actually helped with a bit of recruitment and stuff as well, driving uh, customers around in the cars, picking them up from the airport. Not that that was one of my previous skills, but I like driving, so I, I got into that a little bit as well. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so that was that was much more interesting and a bit more brain fodder, I guess, and sort of getting me back onto the the ladder, if you like, of sort of more. I wouldn't say a, a, a regular job because it wasn't really a, a regular job that many people would identify with, but it was a step up really from where I'd been before. So. Sure. Okay. So then you start to think about okay, where do I go to next? And you mentioned already that you kind of up sticks again. Have, have you still got the van at this point? Do you pack the van and move to Chamonix? Yeah, the van lasted for another couple of years. So it, it made the trip from the UK to Leger. It made the trip to Chamonix. And 
I think I moved house in it another two times and then that was it. It completely went kaput. So, yeah, it, it did me good for 400 quid. I mean, I did end up spending, it, it seemed like every time I went to the garage to get something fixed, it was another 400 euros. So I got the exhaust fixed. I got a few other bits and bobs fixed. And, and two or three times I spent 400 quid on it or 400 euros then um, repairing it and just, just keeping it going, you know. Um, but then ultimately the gearbox just completely went. It wouldn't go into first. It wouldn't go into reverse. So the final move that I did in that van, we had to, <laughs> we had to literally manually sort of try and like um, turn the wheel and then push it into position because we couldn't get it into reverse. And so a friend of mine helped me and we sort of literally <laughs> maneuvered the van into position, rolled down the hill because we couldn't get it into first. I did it like a whatever you call it when you do a quick start into second. And then I was off up the motorway and it was only about five kilometers. My friend was just tailing me behind the motor, behind the van on the motorway just in case it conked out. And that was it. I knew, I knew it was game over, but it made it to the little white house that I lived at. It made uh -huh. it there. And that, that was it. That was it. So two two years later, yeah. I think it lasted. Yeah. So for like four or five years, yeah, four or five years, it lasted me. And um, I got quite attached to it in the end. You know, it wasn't an Audi. It wasn't comfortable. It was no heating. <laughs> You know, there was all kinds of problems with it, and the, and the holes that the lights had come off had been leaking in the back, and God knows what. But yeah, it, it did me well. It served its purpose for 400 quid and a few extra hundred euros to repair it and maintain it. You know, yeah. it wasn't too. Bad, so, Chamonix life then. What what new life did you go into there? Work wise, did your social life change much? What was your yeah, language so skills like by then? <laughs> yeah language skills have got better so um because ver I very much like I just practice until I get it right and I'm not afraid of getting it wrong when I'm speaking French or well now a different language which we'll come back to later I'm sure um so yeah so I'd kind of like when I was going to take the van to the garage I'd learn a phrase like I think it's the pot de chapement or it's the boîte de vitesse and it's like the um, <laughs> I've forgotten the name in English, the exhaust or the speed, the, the gearbox. Um, uh -huh. So I'd learned phrases around a very situational way of learning. So if I had to take the cat to the vets, I'd learn a phrase for that or a couple of phrases. And then I'd try and understand what was said back to me, because the first thing is that you learn how to say something, but you don't necessarily know how to respond when they come back <laughs> to you. So like, OK, yeah. But over time, if you just keep doing that, and you just keep practicing and if if people are nice enough to kind of correct you as well in a nice way and be like oh no it's this word then if you can retain all that and just build on that because i never had lessons when i was living in leger it was just very much off the cuff you know i'll go to the shop or i'll go and do, pick something up for the owners or whatever or i'll go and run an errand i'd make sure i try and like rehearse it and learn it so by the time i got to chamonix my french was getting better but it still wasn't conversational it was just kind of patchy um, and so my first job in Chamonix was working with um, Tui, Crystal Ski, um, in the Chamonix office. Um, and that's where I met my best friend Lizzie. Um, and my social life still revolved around mountain biking because there's quite a big mountain biking scene in Chamonix as well. So yeah, met loads of people there for mountain biking. But then um, I kind of upped my level for snowboarding. So Chamonix as many people might know, is the home of extreme sports and the mountains are really, really steep and it's renowned for quite gnarly everything. Gnarly, Chamonix. Is just gnarly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so that was kind of like similar kind of social setup, but there was much more to do there. So like in Leger, there was only a handful of bars and, you know, quite a lot of restaurants, but not many kind of hangouts. Whereas Chamonix, there was a lot more choice. There's a lot more people because it's like a big, you know, huge long valley, lots of different ha uh, valley uh, villages and stuff as well. So, yeah, lots more to do there and lots more people to meet. So, yeah. And then in terms of um, finances, obviously Chamonix is renowned as a, an amazing tourist resort um, and it's not cheap to even, it's not cheap to go there as a tourist. So what was it like to live there as a resident? also really expensive like pushing on the edges of like London prices for accommodation um, which is a shame because you know it, it, there's a lot of people there that live to service the people that come on holiday so you know but there's also a lot of people who have houses and properties there who, li who live and work in Geneva so it's it's a real um, 
not not like a commuter belt, but it's kind of like, um, you know, a place where people would come and have their weekend house. They have a big job in Geneva. They earn a shit ton of money and then they come up to ski in Chamonix at the weekend or they go to Geneva every day to work and then they come back to Chamonix. So those kind of people can afford to live there and live there very well. Um, whereas the people who kind of live in the more sort of service sector um, really struggle to find accommodation. So there's just not enough of it around. There's not enough affordable um, accommodation as well. And the cheaper accommodation is sort of right on the edges of, of town as well. I mean, I did find a, a small place, that little white house was right in the centre of Chamonix. Um, and that was affordable for a while, but it was also a very old house and it had lots of problems and noise and goodness knows what else. Um, and no real outside space. So you kind of like limited. If you can share with other people, that's great. Um, you can cut the costs down or if you're living with a partner obviously it becomes a lot more affordable and when i first moved to chamonix i was actually living with a boyfriend so we split the cost of a a nice little apartment down in Le Bosson. um but then we broke up so um it was like okay well how are we are you know <laughs> we ended up living together even though we'd broken up six months before we, we were still living together trying to find accommodation for each other well for ourselves should i say um, and so then we parted company and then I went off to live in the little white house and he went wherever he went, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so living on your own there is is really, really tough. So I ended up um, kind of having a sideline job as well. So I, I, I was always quite handy with, um, well, handy with practical stuff in general, but I actually set up a little um, kind of cash only sewing business. So I'd help people fix their ski gear, outdoor equipment, mend rips in their clothes, fix their kids' jeans, you know, stuff like that. And so over the course of the eight years that I was there, um, I actually built that up to be, you know, quite a regular, um, I had loads of regular customers and then friends who'd come to me to fix stuff. So I had my salary from this job, which was like a full-time job uh, working in the office. But on the on the back of that as well, I had to have this sewing job to kind of top up my, my, my money because the cost of accommodation was like, for example, the I think the little White House um it was only about i don't know 20 or 30 meters squared it was tiny and it was like six or seven hundred euros a month mm. so yeah it was it was really 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 expensive and then on top of that if you want to go skiing and you want to go snowboarding and using the lifts in the summer for mountain biking you pretty much have to buy a lift pass because the, the mountains are so steep you know unless you're superwoman and you can pedal up to come down again um you want to buy a lift pass which is like in the region of 800 to a thousand uh, euros a year so you kind of add that in and then you add in you know maybe insurance and everything else as well it's like you know yeah it's an expensive place to live so and, and yeah. food, food and everything as well like yeah just um just pretty expensive so yeah okay what well, um what about the kind i don't know what the word is for it. it's not logistics but it's like and it's not finances but it's like you know about the the local taxes and in social security and all that kind of thing is that something that you'd already set up in leger or was it different in chamonix and how how does that kind yeah. of system work when you live in and working in france so when i first was working in Leger, both companies I worked for were British registered, so I wasn't in the French tax system. So I was earning money in um, pounds and then having to deal with the, um, uh, what's the word, conversion rates and stuff. When I moved to Chamonix, it was an official job, so I was I was on the French tax system and the French payroll. And so, um... <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> Is it um, <laughs> where was I? Uh, the yeah. So at the time, France wasn't on pay as you earn. It was when I left, but it wasn't at the beginning. So um, you had to pay tax in arrears on the previous year's salary. So the first year is effectively tax free, although it's not. You just pay it the following year, and then you pay into Social Security, and you also pay for. Um, uh the doctors basically so there's a system um where you have a carte vitale which is like your healthcare card and you go to the doctors and you pay say 30 euros 35 euros just to be seen by the doctor and you put you give them your carte vitale and basically you get something like 70 percent of your costs reimbursed 
um, and that's for you know pharmacy drugs or whatever else you're getting as well so you, you sort of put it all through and you give over your card card vital and you get about you know um, 70 percent of it covered and then you pay the rest so it's this kind of reimbursement system you pay up front and then it comes back to you through the system um, but yeah the taxes are quite high comparative to the UK and social security wasn't too expensive I forget the percentages but um, again it works on like a banding system so um, you know if you're on like 20 or 30 grand it's this much tax and if you're on 40 or 50 it's this much so the more you earn obviously the more tax you pay so it, it kind of pays to earn less than 30 grand I think at the time anyway um, and then social security was whatever I think I don't know eight or twelve percent or something but also like your employer pays part of the tax too so there's this kind of whole like even though you're employed and you pay your part of the tax the employer pays a good chunk of that as well so it's quite expensive for companies to take on people on the French system because they're paying an equal amount of tax if you like as you are and I think that was why at the time a lot of British companies and tour operators were still paying um, their employees on the British system so that they could avoid paying the tax into the French system because it was so expensive right and that's why resort wages were typically like quite cheap as well if you were on the French system mm. then it was kind of like really low wages and whatnot as well so so yeah compared to the UK it was more expensive on on taxes a little bit as well so yeah and then by the time I left um, two years two or 18 months ago um, they'd just gone on to pay as you earn, um, which was like, oh, hallelujah. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so before we talk about um, you leaving there, because we'll kind of finish on that bit, because, you know, it's going to lead on to an exciting new episode of how you're living your life differently. Um, how many years did you end up living in France altogether? Um, it's Bella. Hello. <laughs> Um, I think 10 years. Say hi. <laughs> I think 10 did years. You, oh, cute. Yeah. Did you, and did you, did you have any idea at the time? I know you mentioned, um, you, you know, when you spoke to friends and family about it, that maybe some of them were thinking like, oh, she'll be back in six months or whatever. Did you ever think in your mind that you might be there 10 years or or was it just kind of you were you were rolling with it and just I just kind rolled of suck it, it and see 100%, yeah. yeah I think even for the first two years people were still like oh when are you coming back and I was like I don't know not sure that I will and I think you know the yeah, first six yeah. months it was, it was very much like you know every other person would say like oh how's it going when are you coming back because they just thought I was just going for an extended holiday or something I don't know um, and then eventually it just sort of became like, oh, well, she's in France now, so we'll stop asking her, thank God. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I just I just roll with the punches. I was just like, you know, I'll just see what happens. And if like, you know, it just be, kind of became back to, especially moving to Chamonix and having that kind of regular Monday to Friday job, um, although it was not necessarily Monday to Friday because I was working airport weekends and stuff, but um, <laughs> God, airport days. Mm. <laughs> um yeah, it, it, was, it was very much more getting back into a kind of a, a normal, you know, working week, if you like. And then the weekends or the days off that I had were just sort of spent on the mountain and chilling out and stuff. So, so yeah, that kind of quickly became okay. just normal. So it was just kind of like, oh, well, this is my life now. And I'm living in Chamonix and it's just, you know, it is what it is. And I'm quite happy. So, yeah. Let Let's just quickly mention the weather. So you've gone from um, Nottingham, the kind of heart of the East Midlands, not known for its, you know, dumping of snow or its gorgeous <laughs> summers. Obviously, living in Leger and Chamonix, you've got two quite distinct seasons, haven't you? The, the pretty hot summers and the pretty chilly winters. How did you adapt to that? Was that difficult at first or was that quite exciting and new? Yeah, it was just new. It was just a bit different. Like in, in, you know, in the Alps, it can get up to like 30 degrees in the summer and hotter, um, even if you're living at altitude, which which was quite weird to me because that was like, I'm in a ski resort. Why is it like 30 degrees in the summer? Um, but yeah, no, that was that just quickly became normal. And, and, you know, you have to buy clothes to adapt to that, obviously. Right. Because, you know, you're, you're going from, mm. you know, T-shirts and vests and, you know, flip flops in the summer to like every layer that you could possibly wear just to get out and scoop snow away from the car to get to work in the morning um and you know minus 12 minus 15 just on the day to day you know just walking around town and then when you get on the mountain it's like it can be you know with wind chill minus ridiculous 
Um, and so you, I, I guess the only thing I can think is that my wardrobe massively changed to adapt to that. <laughs> well, this is just, this is just what it is. It's just extremely hot in the summer and the odd, you know, shitty rainy day coming into autumn and stuff. And then extremely cold in the winter and snowy. So you just get a different wardrobe to suit. And it's just like, literally the only, the only thing I remember is just like, right, the summer wardrobe's going away now and all the winter gear comes out. Like that's it. It was a huge transition, you know, in, in the sort of autumn. Um, and just having like options of ski gear and options of, you know, whatever and different winter boots and waterproof boots and stuff. So yeah, that, that was the only real difference really I can, I can think of is just, that's very materialistic, isn't it? The clothing and the, the stuff that you need. And then I was like, oh, I need some snowshoes. Oh, I need some poles. Oh, I need, you know, <laughs> a different type of snowboard for this kind of conditions. Or, you know, I need to wax my snowboard now because it's going into winter and I need to service my equipment. And and then at the end of the winter, it's like, right, I need to dust off my mountain bike and get all that serviced. And so it was just very, very much like, yeah, seasonal changes for me were more like sport related and clothing. <laughs> clothing <related. laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's good. So thinking back now, um, it's been really to talk about this because it's brought back so many memories for me as well, especially when you set off in that little van and you rang me an hour down the road saying that you thought you set it on fire. Um, but yeah, just I remember being so proud of you at that time that you, you were just making this massive life change and I was excited for you and nervous for you and everything but looking back now and reflecting on it is there anything you think you would have done differently if you were going to do it again or and yeah anything that you would have done differently um I don't think so it just it just happened do you know what I mean like yeah I'm not really one for looking back anyway like you know um yeah I don't I don't think I would have changed anything no I mean having a bit of extra cash would have been nice but you know that wasn't that wasn't really you know anything that important that lottery win was you know really good timing has to be said um no I wouldn't have changed anything no it would have been great to I, I'm not even, I was gonna say it would have been great to get a, a better paid job but I was just so out of that mindset at that time of like you know materialistic stuff and going from like oh my god you know having money and like I said keeping up with the Joneses all that that had just gone and so yeah I just got on with it I think that was the kind of like I said it was a very pragmatic kind of mindset and very much like I just need to make this work and I need to be happy and you know mm. I'll just happen so now I probably wouldn't change anything because it is what it is and, and the journey that I've had has been you know there's been ups and downs and bumps along the way but I wouldn't change anything I don't think. Mm. What advice would you give to somebody that was thinking about making a big change in their life like like you had at the time you know whether it's a good bike change in financial circumstances or something else what advice would you give? Um, don't sweat the small stuff too much like don't and also don't make too much of a plan. I think that was what was kind of good for me was like, I got, I found a job. I hadn't really done that much research about the area. I sort of knew it was good for mountain biking and I'd got a job and that was it. I kept it really basic. I hadn't like overthought, I'm going to do this in the first six months and then I'm going to do that because that plan could have failed. Right. So, and again, I've never been one for making a plan for anything. I've just, my whole life has just been roll with it and see what happens. Um, so don't overthink it. Don't make too much of a plan. Obviously, if you've got kids, it's a different kettle of fish because you're going to have to think about schooling and all that kind of stuff as well. But for anybody like me that's single and, you know, doesn't have kids. Um, yeah, just um, don't overthink it. Have a have a have a loose plan, but don't make it too solid. Um, learn some language if you want before you go. Like I said, I didn't really um, I didn't really do that. I kind of, you know, I. And again, Leger, Chamonix are very English speaking anyway. So um, just be brave. Just, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Don't worry too much about, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people might be in that position now with, you know, the pandemic and everything and mm. thinking, that, oh, my God, my world's falling apart because this is happening and da, da, da. And I, and I will say, like, I was super stressed about the house and payments and crushing um, anxiety about paying the mortgage and everything else you can get past it so no matter how shit you feel maybe at the moment and you think like oh my god how am I going to get out of this you can do it you can totally do it so try and look past like the uh, what's the word I'm looking for the 
the angst or the the kind of the, the hole that you might feel like you're in you can always get out of it you can always come out the other mm. side I've done it so if I can do it and I'm very much <laughs> you know I don't know if I can do it anyone can really so yeah I don't know if that answers the question very well but <laughs> good yeah it does I, I just think you've got a really good insight into making a massive life decision and I think it's just really topical to be happy having these discussions right now because we are still living through a, pan, a global pandemic and I know there are a lot of people that are struggling financially perhaps they've lost their job or they're at risk of losing their job or they've been furloughed they're on you know 20% less money a month I think people are starting to think quite differently about life so I think your insight is really really valuable so I appreciate you talking today and reflecting yeah. on everything that's happened the good and the bad you know yeah. Um, just before we go, um, the reason why your internet is garbage, isn't it? Say again. <laughs> this sums it up. I was saying just before we go, there's a reason why your internet is garbage, isn't it? In terms of where you're living right. Now. Yeah. So I am um, in the kind of the, the the hills. I wouldn't call them mountains, but I'm currently sat um, talking to you from central Portugal. Uh, on the edge of a forest so yeah I'm out in the middle of not quite the middle of nowhere but I'm on the, the edge of the the hillside above a little village so uh, yeah it's a little bit shit for, for internet connection <laughs> <laughs> but um, even though the internet's garbage um, I think what we'll do is speak again about your new life in Portugal because that's a whole different episode of how you ended up there, what you're doing, how are things going socially, work-wise, financially, um, and just, yeah, how you're living life differently in Portugal. So look forward to the episode. But for, for the time being, thank you so, so much for talking today. It's been a real kind of journey down memory lane. It's really yeah smile a lot thank you i'm excited that i'm your first episode as well so i, I can't wait to see your <laughs> interview as well and to see other people's experiences as well that's going to be really cool so it's going to be awesome thanks ellie no worries sis <laughs>